Hey folks, Todd Colburn here from Cal Poly Pomona with your Aerospace Structures series. Today we're going to be looking at beams and we're specifically going to drill down on the shear and moment relations. This is mostly a review of something that should have been covered in your statics classes. However, this is so critical for a thorough understanding of structural mechanics we're going to give you another dive into that now. So stay tuned and let's see how it looks. Now thinking back to statics, we looked at equivalent forces, force systems. We learned about equilibrium and we imposed equilibrium to find equivalent force systems one versus another. We went on to look at the application for trusses. And we started out by first looking at the constraints on a truss, removing those constraints, placing the forces that represent uh, the, the fixity of that constraint. And then we analyzed, we imposed equilibrium to determine what the external forces are. We had a series of applied forces like this force P on this truss at Linode C. And then we calculated reactive forces that represent the constraints like our reactions RA and RB. Now we then learned to go and evaluate the internal. So these are all external forces on the truss. Once you have an applied set of forces, those are external. And the reactions also can be considered external to the truss itself. Now, once we understand this principle, we then went onward to determine what are the internal forces in the truss elements. We took section cuts and evaluated piecemeal. We either used a method of sections, which took a cut, pulled it apart, replaced the cuts, at the cuts, replaced the forces, or we used the method of joints, where we exploded our whole structure, removing every member from the joints, and then we drew all of the forces acting on each joint and all of the forces acting on each member. For this particular truss, that would look like this. Now you'll notice here, we still have the external forces shown in order to have a free body diagram. We've got the force P and the reactions RA and RB. But we also now see the internal forces. We see that at node A, we not only have the reaction RA applied to it, we also have the internal force PAC acting along that rod and the internal force PAB acting along that rod. And we can impose equilibrium, meaning summing our forces in the vertical direction and summing our forces in the horizontal direction at node A to solve for the magnitude of the internal forces. We did the same thing at node C. We can see we have the applied force or the external force P and the two internal forces PAC and PBC. You'll notice each rod that has been split apart, on one side the internal force is acting and if it's tension, then uh, regardless of whether it's tension or compression, on the other side of that member it's going to be an equal and opposite force. So a member in tension will be pulling on both, a member in compression will be pushing on both. Now these are just general uh, positive sign forces. If we actually solve this, we would find that PAC is compressive for this truss, as is PBC. But this, uh, so this diagram on the right shows the external forces, P, R, A, and R, B, and the internal forces, P, A, C, P, B, C, and PAB. Now if we did the same thing for a beam, a beam is designed to carry transverse loads. Now instead of axial forces, which we may also have in some cases, we're going to instead see shear and moments developing within the beam. If we looked at the external forces on a beam, uh, this particular beam looks like we have a nice standard beam. Who knows what the cross section is? Maybe it's rectangular, maybe an I-beam. We have an external applied force P, and we have two reactions RA and RB. If we then break that apart, we find out that we have internal forces as well. We're going to have shear forces and moments 
within the element, as we see in span AC, we have a shear and moment. The change is along the beam as a function of where we take that cut. And between joint uh, node C and node B, we see that we have a shear and a moment also that actually changes along that beam. This is what we're going to look at today in how to calculate those shear and moment forces. Okay. So let's just start out with a simple pinned pin beam with a, uh, a applied transverse force P. Okay. And our goal here is to write a function that expresses the shear along the beam and the moment along the beam. Sometimes we'll find that the shear is constant along portions of the beam. Sometimes we'll find that the moment is constant along portions of the beam. But often those two values will both change. So our goal is to write this function. What is our shear as a function of x position? What is our moment as a function of x position? So the challenge here is we're going to need a different function every time something changes along the beam. So if we look at the beam we move from left to right, we see at node A we're going to have a reaction to A. So between A and C we're going to have one function. But you'll notice there's no other external loads introduced between A and C. Therefore, one function will be needed for shear, V of X, and one function will be needed for moment, M of X. Now, once we pass node C, we find we now have a change to the applied forces or the external forces. Therefore, that's going to likely change the internal forces. So once we pass node C, we're now going to need a different function to evaluate the shear as a function of X and the moment as a function of X. If we then continue along from C toward B, we see nothing changes, nothing changes until we get to the right end of the beam, and after that we're done, so we don't need a third function. So this beam will require two functions to evaluate the shear at any point, and two functions to evaluate the moment at any point. Let's take a look at this further. So our basic process is like this. What we're going to do is we're going to calculate all reactions on the beam. We do this by isolating a point, Summing our moments is usually wisest and gets us an answer first, fastest. Then we sum our forces, and we're just imposing equilibrium systematically until we have all reactions. Next, we're going to cut the beam after the first load change. So if we look at this beam moving from left to right, we see at node A we have a, a force introduced. Right now it just is shown as an external, as a constraint. But when we replace that constraint, we find out it has a vertical force. So right at point A, we have a change to the external loading on the beam. Therefore, we're going to make a free body diagram from the left end of the beam to some point between A and C. Okay, We're going to sketch a free body diagram of that segment just to the left of that. And we're going to show the shear and moment internally at the cut. And we will assume a positive direction for those. We will then sum our moments and forces in order to determine our shear function of x in that span and our moment function of x in that span. We then will cut the beam after the next load change. We see so at point A we introduced an external load. We needed one function for right after that, one for shear, one for moment. Then we pass node C. We have an external load change, so we need a new function. And so now we're going to cut it somewhere to the right of point C, but before we get to any other external loads, we then draw a free body diagram and repeat the steps. Free body diagram, calculate, impose equilibrium to calculate V and M as functions of X. And then we keep doing that until we run out of external loads on the beam or reach the right end. Okay, that's our basic process. If we take a look at our beam here, we see that we're going to need one set of functions for the span AC, because at A the external loads change, and at C the external loads change, and then they don't change again until the end. So we're going to need a function to represent span AC for shear, and another one for moment, 
and we're going to need a function to represent shear and moment from in span CB. Okay? Now, if we later go back and want to evaluate what the shear or moment is within any, at any point on the beam, we'll have to select the correct function that corresponds with that segment. All right. Quick word before we continue on sign convention. When we're dealing with beams, we're going to introduce what we call beam sign convention. It's a special sign convention. So if you look at uh, figure A is a typical beam. We're going to focus on a little segment. We're going to make a little section cut just to the right of point A and draw a free body diagram, which is our figure B. You notice we can see the reaction at A. And then we're going to draw our shear and moment. And these are drawn in the positive coordinate system for beam sign convention. When we're dealing with beam sign convention, what we're going to do, moving from left to right, we're going to call a positive shear one that chops off the beam as you move from left to right, as shown here. And a positive moment is one that induces smiley face bending, which we'll look at in just a second. But that happens to cause compression on the upper surface. You'll notice if you grab that beam and, and apply that moment, it will give you smiley face bending. Okay? So this is how that looks. Figure uh, segment B and segment C show basically the same thing. If we look a little closer at the entire beam, we see the smiley face bending will cause that beam to rotate in a smiley face like we see in A. So if this was positive, then the reacting moment on this side is positive. It's going to bend that into a smiley face. However, if we have a negative moment, it's going to turn, turn it into a frowny face, as you can see in figure B here. That's a negative moment beam sign convention, okay? Now let's just think about this a little further versus our other sign conventions we use a lot, the right-hand rule. Now if we had the right-hand rule, this is our sign convention. We have an x, y, z axis, and any force that's acting in the positive x, positive y, or positive z is considered positive, and any moment that's got the orientation of the moment aiming down the x, y, or z axis is considered positive. That is right-hand rule sign convention. And we will use this most of the time in engineering. However, when we deal with beams, that means a beam that looks like a horizontal beam that has transverse loads, we will often use beam sign convention in, instead. And that causes some of the signs to differ. Now, for any, even when we're using beam sign convention, any moments that are cannot be defined with beam sign convention for that orientation, we will go back to right-hand rule. So we're always using right-hand rule, except for the special cases where we have something that's clearly a beam and we're using beam sign convention. If we look at beam sign convention further, we see in figure A what a typical beam might be. So positive shear will be chopping off the beam, moving from left to right as we see. Positive moment is smiley face bending, which is inducing compression on the top. As we see there in figure B, we're looking right smack dab at the end, perpendicular to the end, and we see how that looks. Now, if you look at this carefully, you realize that that shear is chopping off the beam. That's positive, and it's going in the negative y direction. You'll also notice that that moment, which is positive for beam sign convention, actually is negative for right-hand rule, because right-hand rule would have a positive moment like this, aiming down the x-axis. So you need to be alert what sign convention is being used. In this section, whenever we're dealing with beams, it's traditional to use beam sign convention. However, you need to be multilingual in both right-hand rule and beam sign convention and be alert enough to figure out which one is required for a certain problem. If we take a look at beam sign convention versus right-hand rule further, we see in figure A, we have beam sign convention because we have something that's smiley face bending for that whole beam, and that uh, still has a moment that corresponds with right-hand rule for the MY, but the MX is in beam sign convention. And in the second figure B here, we see both the moment X and the moment Y are right-hand rule. That's a right-hand rule sign convention. Okay, so with that said, understanding our sign convention, let's take a quick look, a refresher from statics on our constraints.
We saw a few different kinds of constraints. For example, we have this first one is a pin joint where we can have an Rx and an Ry and our deflections are zero. We have a roller joint which will only translate an Ry and only our vertical deflection is zero. We have a fixity where we have both uh, uh, our x, our y, and a mz, a moment perpendicular to that, and our deflections and slopes are all zero. We haven't dealt with slope yet, but we will be dealing with that very soon in our next lecture. We have a free end where we have no reactions or constraints, and then every now and then we'll run into a hinge on the beam, which actually will give us a zero moment at the hinge. Zero moment at the hinge, but it still can transfer shear. So with that refresher from statics, we're ready to drill down further and make sure we understand how to calculate shear moment diagrams for a beam that we might encounter. So let's take a look at this beam we saw before. Once again, we've got points A, B, and C. We've got a couple constraints. We have one external load in this case at point C. We've got dimensions on the beam and we're defining our x moving from left to right, okay? Our first goal, our first thing we should do is redraw the beam as a free body diagram. I call this a loading diagram because we basically have all the same information that we had on the original beam, which means all external uh, loads like P, all dimensions which locate all critical elements like the length of the beam and the location of various external forces, and we have replaced our constraints with reactions. Once we have this, we're ready to start analyzing that beam. So we, saw, we start by solving for reactions. It's convenient to just take the sum of moments about point A in this case. If we did that, we'd say that see the A plus B times our B minus PA equals zero. And that tells us when we read, uh, when we rearrange this equation, we find out that RB is PA over A plus B, or PA over L, okay? Now, if we now sum our forces, we see that our A minus P plus RB equals zero, and if we rearrange that, we get this, which gives us this, which gives us that, which gives us that, so we find that our A is PB over A plus B, or PB over L, okay? Now we have all reactions on the beam. All external forces are now defined. We're ready to start looking at what are the internal forces and moments in the beam. So first, we cut the beam. Take a look. We just made a cut, that green cut, between after the first external load, RA, and before the next external load, P, we make a cut. So that's between A and C. We now draw every part of the beam to the left of that cut, and then we draw, we replace the part of the beam that we remove with the internal forces that it can transfer. In this case, that's a, a shear and a moment. We'll draw those in the positive direction, which means shear is chopping off the beam, moving from left to right for beam sign convention, and our moment is smiley face bending, which gives us compression on the top. You'll notice we could actually transfer an axial force also. We could also be showing uh, or a Px, a P on this beam as a function of x. But because there is no reaction in the x direction at, our, at node A, we are just ignoring that because we already can see by inspection it's obvious that that internal force is zero. Okay, now we're going to call the shear v of x, and we're going to also denote it as the part that's only valid from a to c. And we're going to call the moment m of x, b, and we're going to denote it as a to c as well, since it's only valid from a to c. These may be constants, or they may be changing as x changes. Okay, So in order to find out what functions we have for v of x and m of x, we now sum our forces and moments on this little sub-free body. So when we sum our force in the vertical direction, we find out that Ra minus Vxac equals zero, and that tells us that the shear from A to C is simply Ra, which is Pb over A plus B. Okay. We then sum our moments about the, and this is gonna sum the moments 
calling this positive, and we're going to actually sum them at the point where we took the cut at some distance x. And so as we sum those moments, we find out minus x times ra, since that's going in the negative assumed direction, plus mxac is equal to zero. We find out that mac is simply xra, which we can write this way. We now have the two functions for our shear and moment that are valid from A to C. Okay. We are now ready for our next section cut. So after the next external load, P, we make a cut just to the right of that. And we draw a free body diagram of the portion of the beam that's to the left of the cut, and we replace the part of the beam that we removed with the forces and moments that it can transfer. Once again, we're ignoring the axial force since that's clearly zero. We're going to draw them in the positive directions. We have V of X from C to B, and we have M of X that's valid from C to B. If we go through this again, we sum our vertical forces. We find RA minus P plus, uh, minus V of X from C to B equals zero, which we can solve like this and find out that this is the relation. And then we sum our moments at that point where we're x away from the left end, minus rx times ra, since that's going in the negative assumed direction, plus x minus a times p, plus that moment from c to b equals zero. And we can rearrange and plug and chug until we find the relation for the moment from c to b. Now, one thing you'll notice here, when I sum my forces and moments, you'll notice I always put vertical force. When I sum my force in the y up above, I have a vertical force I'm showing that I'm calling upwards positive. Even though we're using beam sign convention and showing b downward positive, I can choose either direction when I'm actually making any summation, and I always show the direction that I'm assuming, upward positive for my shears, and usually right-hand rule for my moments. Even though the Shear and moment are defined using beam sign convention. When we sum our forces and moments, as long as we're consistent within that equation, then this is fine. The key thing here is I'm always showing what direction I'm assuming is positive when I make those summations. You'll find if you're very careful about this, this will really help you to not make mistakes. Okay. So now we have a function. We have evaluated this beam, and we have found out we have calculated the shear and the moment for every segment needed. Now on other beams, we might need more. We're gonna to need to make as many cuts as we have changes in external load as we go from left to right. And a change in external load includes both forces and moments on this beam as we move from left to right. This is how it's done, and this is how we can get a relation for the internal loads in a beam. So let's take a look and practice a little bit. If we look at this beam we just saw, how many section cuts did we need? Well, if you move from left to right, you see we need one right after the A, and then we don't change any external loads until we pass P. So we'll need one cut between A and C and one cut between C and B. This means we need two section cuts, which means we're gonna get two of each function, two shear functions and two moment functions. If we have a beam like this one here, we find moving from left to right, we're going to have a load introduced at A and another one at point C where the moment is and then nothing else. So we once again need to make two section cuts to evaluate this. We'll get two functions for shear and two functions for moment. Now if we have something like this here, we look, ooh, this is a little more complicated. Right after point A, we have at point A, we have an external force, so we're going to need a cut to the right of that. Then, after A inches into, when X equals A, we have this W starting. So we're going to need to make a cut somewhere to the right of the start of W on the beam, that distributed load. We then don't have any change, even though the distributed load is still continuing. We don't have a change until that distributed load stops. So then we'll need to make another cut after we hit the end of B. So A plus B and then we need another cut, and then there's no other change to the end of the beam. So we actually need three section cuts for this beam. 
See that? How about if we have something like this? Now we look, we see we're going to need, you're probably getting good at this, three section cuts. How about this one? We have this guy. It looks like we've got our reaction at A. So we're going to need one cut. Then the moment, we're going to need another cut. Then a force, we're going to need another cut. Then another force, we're going to need another cut. We need four cuts for this beam. That means we're going to have four functions for V of X and four functions for M of X. How about this one here? Oh my gosh. This looks terrible, but it ain't that bad. Take a look at it. We're going to say, okay. We've got the external force the reaction today. So we need to cut there. We need to cut for the force. We need to cut after W starts and another one after it ends. We're going to need another cut after P, another cut after the other W starts, and another one after it ends, and then we're done. Looks like we need seven cuts on this mother in order to evaluate that completely. That means we're going to have seven functions for V of X seven functions for m of x. Obviously, as if we have a simple beam with only a couple cuts needed, it's not a big deal to make these successive cuts and develop additional equations. But really, this is not going to be very efficient. And for this reason, it would be very convenient if we could write a single function for the shear and moment a single function for the shear from left to right end, and a single function for the moment from left to right end. We're actually going to learn how to do that. The power of singularity functions is going to allow us to write a single function for the loading on the beam, which we then can use a really simple integration to turn into the shear, and then the moment, and then later into deflections, slopes and deflections as well. So that is how we develop the moment relations, the shear and moment relations on a beam. This is just a direct extension of what you learned in your statics class, and it's critical that you can do this near flawlessly. Study, be great, enjoy.